This is Tower 22, a U.S. military base located in the far northeastern corner of the country of Jordan. In the early morning hours on January 28, 2024, an enemy drone attack killed three American soldiers and injured approximately 40 others. This unprecedented attack on Jordan soil marks the first U.S. troops that were KIA by the Iranian-backed proxies since the enemy first started launching their strikes in October 2023. Fears then increased that the U.S. and Iran would be unable to stop escalating before a point of no return was reached. But why is the U.S. military in Jordan in the first place? What went wrong with this attack that it was able to be pulled off successfully? Was the U.S. military's retaliation effective at stopping the enemy? This episode has everything you need to know about the unfolding crisis in the Middle East. The United States and Jordan actually have a pretty tight bilateral relationship for over 70 years now. Their warm and fuzzy allows for 3,000 total U.S. troops to be stationed here. From Jordan's perspective, the benefit is that the U.S. has provided them with more than $20 billion in assistance since since 1951. That money has been used to fully renovate 25 hospitals, and most recently they got 12 Black Hawk helicopters, which are very useful in counter-terror missions. Now, if we put on our strategic thinking caps, these troops are important partly because of a single base called the Al-Tanf base, largely made up of 200 high-speed special operators. It isn't even located inside Jordan, but instead just across the fence over in Syria. Al-Tanf garrison is pretty much the only thing standing in the way of Iran having a clear straight shot supply route to funnel weapons through Iraq, through Syria, and then into Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's located right on the Baghdad-Damascus highway, and according to the Brookings Institute, it denies Iran one of the three potential land bridge routes between Iran and the Mediterranean. And so from the perspective of Iran and its proxy militia groups, they very much do not want the Al-Tanf base or Tower 22 in Jordan standing in their way. So then what's the whole point of having the Tower 22 base in Jordan? What does it accomplish? It's a relatively small outpost with only 350 US Army and Air Force troops stationed there. Its location is extremely remote out in the middle of the desert, surrounded by a whole lot of nothing. It's directly on the demilitarized part of the border with Syria, and only nine miles away from the Iraqi border, so special forces units are able to quietly tiptoe in and out of the region easily. From a humanitarian point of view, the base protects the nearby Rukban refugee camp, where about 7,500 Syrian civilians have lived since ISIS forced them there in 2014. The camp even once housed 100,000 civilians. Having that extra security here can be useful because in 2016, ISIS struck the refugee camp with a car bomb. So Tower 22 was established in 2015, was originally created to help train, advise, and assist Jordanian soldiers to fight off the extremist ISIS group as they tried to encroach on their country. It's located only 12 miles from the Al-Tanf base, so it serves as a major resupply and logistics center Here's how I would assume it all works based on how my old operations played out in Iraq. U.S. supplies, ammo, personnel, they can't be flown straight into Syria. Last time I checked, Syria's Damascus International Airport isn't exactly accepting direct flights from the U.S. Air Force. So instead, these supplies are flown into Jordan's Salty Air Base. Then it's loaded onto transport across Highway 40 to Tower 22, where food can be safely stored in freezers, and then finally, probably on a monthly schedule, ammo and food is then resupplied to Al-Tanf base in Syria. But the base isn't just for logistics. Tower 22 has a secret side quest mission with the purpose of flying drones for surveillance in the entire region. This intelligence is then used by Jordan and US military officials to plan strikes against the enemy militia. This more accurate satellite image of Tower 22 shows there are about nine helicopter takeoff and landing pads and what looks like one aircraft hangar where the drones are likely stored and that leads out to a runway where the drones can take off from. It's not just special ops, high-speed, low-drag mofos here. In reality, the vast majority of the soldiers stationed at Tower 22 are support personnel, engineering units, and drone operators. Okay, so that explains why they were there. How the heck was the enemy able to get a drone past the defensive systems? Prior to this attack, rocket, mortar, drone attacks on US forces in Iraq and Syria have become a daily occurrence with over 160 strikes since October 7th. But up until that point, they'd failed to even seriously injure a single soldier. When the enemy continues to fail and fail, it can have a tendency to create a feeling of complacency among leadership when it comes to addressing threats. Furthermore, 
The threat assessment considered that Tower 22 was extremely low risk. Part of the logic for that was because enemy attacks pretty much always take place inside neighboring Iraq and Syria instead. It was a kind of unwritten rule that the enemy wouldn't strike outposts in Jordan. Why would they choose to do that on their own free will? Because they feared the retaliation that escalation would rain down upon them, and we'll get into that soon. You might be wondering why, why weren't the Patriot air defense missile systems protecting this outpost against drones? A 2018 International Institute for Strategic Studies report found that the U.S. Army operates a total of 50 Patriot missile batteries. What this means is that they can't be everywhere all at once, throughout the Middle East, Europe, and the Pacific. Their deployments need to be prioritized based on the level of perceived threat, otherwise it would appear like these assets were being wasted. I was stationed at a similarly sized outpost in Iraq over a decade ago, and we had zero air defense capabilities. Not a whole lot has changed since then. The other big asset, the CRAM air defense system, they're always reserved for the forward operating bases, the FOBs that have several thousand soldiers, and more importantly, your high ranking fancy generals. Based on this budget document, I believe the Army has about 53 of these CRAMs in their inventory, which also limits their deployment. These two systems, Patriot and the CRAM, work best when they're using a layered air defense network so that they're able to cover down on each other, but they're not necessarily an economical use of firepower for a small, tiny outpost, which we have hundreds of. Tower 22 had to rely on electronic warfare systems that are designated to disable enemy drones and disrupt their signal so they can't hit you. There were no systems located located there that could fire kinetic shots at the drones or aircraft as far as I can tell. The word kinetic in military terms is different from your physics class. It means actually firing a physical projectile at incoming drones, and it's one of the most overused buzzwords in the military. Hua. So how did this drone succeed where past ones had failed? There are a number of theories and explanations from officials. According to preliminary reports from the military that haven't been made public yet, the enemy drone was either mistaken for friendly aircraft by the counter UAV radar systems, or it flew too low to the ground to even be identified by radar. It's unclear exactly what happened or if it was a combination of different factors. One thing I think they probably did was take advantage of any sign of complacency on the base. So if the drone operators were taking the drones off and then landing them at the same time every day and not changing the schedule, the enemy could exploit the fact that they were being predictable. This way, they could time their own attack so that the radars were already expecting an incoming friendly drone to land at that time. This way, Tower 22 would see the enemy drone and assume it was just a friendly one returning back to base as scheduled basically fooling the radar system. So to that point, I dug up this document from the Department of Defense that reveals that an Air Force radar TPS-75 was located here in 2022, although I don't know if it's still there, but according to an interview with The Intercept, who spoke to an anonymous soldier who served at Tower 22 in 2023, he said that radar was broken 80% of the time that he was there. This radar is originally from the 1970s, so that's not a surprise. And as far as I know, it can only be pointed in one fixed direction at a time. Bases need newer radars that have 360 degree coverage. Tower 22 may have had some drone interceptors located there, some kinetic abilities. We don't know for sure, but without radar systems that can detect friendly versus foe, it wouldn't really matter. So the enemy drone, by one way or another, human error, we don't know. It got through the defensive systems. So aren't the living quarters armored? This is a US Army container housing unit. We call it a CHU in Iraq. Pretty much every soldier lives in these when deployed. Usually two to a room, but one if you're lucky. They're made of extremely flimsy and thin, cheap stamped metal and offer zero protection. That's why you stack sandbags all around them in concrete. But the most vulnerable part that I want to draw your attention to is the top. Some bigger fobs have some overhead concrete protection against mortars, but in this case, you wouldn't even need that at all. All you would need is a strong net hung over the barracks to catch a drone. An hour and a half after the drone hit Tower 22 base, Iranian proxy militias launched another drone at the Al Tanf base, but Raytheon's Coyote uncrewed aerial interceptor shot it down successfully, according to DoD officials. The US military is purchasing 600 of these Coyote interceptors, which will help on these kinds of remote bases. But what was the US diplomatic and military response? In the aftermath of the attacks, US President Biden said, quote, we will hold all those responsible to account at a time and manner of our choosing. And Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made a statement that we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our troops, and our interests. 
In a second, we're going to get into the U.S. retaliatory strikes, whether or not they were successful, if they took out the enemy leaders or not. But first, when it comes to learning about effective counter UAS, I thought it would be great to work with this episode's sponsor, Raytheon, to get some behind the scenes exclusive access into their insight on this challenge. The threat posed by enemy drones is real and proliferating. We already know that. It's evident in current day conflicts around the globe. These threats are fast, maneuverable, and inexpensive to obtain and deploy. They're launched in singles and in swarms, designed to overwhelm defenses. All of these factors pose their own challenges and require a solution tailored to this threat set, from detect to defeat. The company's high-performing sensors and cost-effective kinetic and non-kinetic effectors, integrated with a command and control architecture, can handle a highly saturated air picture. That means it can take out drone swarms and allows air defenders to easily react to complex scenarios, even in bad weather. First, we'll go over the kinetic interceptors, which includes the combat proof in Coyote Block 2, which is a low-cost kinetic effector for counter UAS missions. The Coyote is able to down drones at longer ranges and higher altitudes than other systems. It can defeat drones of varied sizes and maneuverability. Coyote effectors are affordable and therefore cost-effective to counter the low-cost UAS threats. Coyote Block 2 is enabled by Raytheon's KU Band Radio Frequency Sensor, or KERF's radar, to provide detect and defeat capabilities in the defense against UAS. What is KERF's? It provides 360-degree threat detection. In fact, multi-mission KERF's is so accurate, it can detect a 9mm bullet, and according to Raytheon, it has very few false alarms or drop tracks. The radar offers flexibility of fixed relocatable curves and mobile KU-720 deployment options. Precision targeting curves discriminates between actual targets and clutter. These proven capabilities are crucial components of the U.S. Army's counter UAS solution, LIDS which stands for the Low, Slow, Small, Unmanned Aircraft Integrated Defeat System. Curves and Coyote Block 2, as part of the U.S. Army's LIDs, are currently deployed globally across multiple combatant commands. Now for the non-kinetic side. Raytheon's High Energy Laser, or HEL, is a cost-effective non-kinetic solution to destroying enemy drones. With each shot costing less than a cup of coffee, HEL is an attractive option to engage cheap drones either as a standalone system or as part of an integrated air defense solution. The HEL gunner uses a video game style remote control that's incredibly user friendly and easy to train on. The system's fire control computer identifies and automatically tracks enemy targets using integrated Raytheon sensors. The HEL is scalable up to 50 kilowatts with a modular design so you can throw it on the back of a light tactical vehicle and still take down an enemy drone in a matter of seconds. The system has already been deployed to combat zones around the world, although Raytheon was unable to disclose exactly where as of this time. One important thing to note is that counter UAS capabilities are best deployed as part of a layered air defense. This ensures you're matching the right effect to the threat. While traditional air defense systems are capable of detecting and defeating drone threats, you really don't want to launch a high value missile at a $1,000 drone, for example. That would get the job done, but it's not the best use of your arsenal. CUAS solutions are a more effective and efficient way to counter the drone threat that you're facing. The problem of drones is only going to get worse in the future. Raytheon has developed the technologies as well as a complete and customizable system that enables ground forces to defeat complex UAS threats in any environment. Raytheon sets the pace of performance with their radars, sensors, kinetic, and non-kinetic effectors that detect and defeat enemy drones wherever they fly, hover, or swarm. The Iranian-backed Shia militia in Iraq that was behind the attacks in Jordan, they broke the taboo and launched attacks inside Jordan. Specifically, the group called Khatib Hezbollah in Iraq, they were responsible. It appears like they might not have expected their attack to be that successful because on January 30th, just a few days after the attack, they made some diplomatic statements of their own that you don't normally hear in these kinds of situations. The Wall Street Journal reported that the leader of the group said that it was halting attacks on U.S. bases and troops. He said, quote, we announced the suspension of military and security operations against the occupation forces. Abu Hassin al-Hamadawi, the group's secretary general, said that they would adopt a temporary passive defense. Well, let's see what that translates to in uh, diplomatic buzzwords. Personally, the impression I get is that they all of a sudden want to de-escalate. Unfortunately for them, they would have no such luck. Because in response, on February 3rd, U.S. bombers hit more than 85 different targets located at seven locations throughout Iraq and Syria. These targets were hand-picked, especially because they were said to be associated with some of Iran's Quds Force, 
The Quds Force specializes in unconventional warfare, military operations. They're basically described as like similar to the American CIA and how they operate on the ground. The installations that were hit included your command and control headquarters, drone and ammo storage sites, killing at least 40 enemies. Many of the strikes were pulled off using America's B-1 bombers that appear to have taken off from the continental U.S. and flew some 7,000 miles before dropping their payload. But in the aftermath of that strike, it became clear that it didn't really change anything at first. Experts who were analyzing these attacks were very puzzled at first. They thought that the strikes were more subdued than expected. The Middle East Institute even commented how Washington gave away their element of surprise and telegraphed what they were gonna do, which gave the militia groups plenty of time over a week to go and hide and prepare for the retaliation. They were surprised that the US didn't target any of Iran's proxy's leadership. Were they being lulled into a false sense of security? Because on February 7th, just a few days later, a US special operations mission kicked off inside Baghdad, the capital of Iraq. The target was none other than the leader of Kateb Hezbollah named Abu Barik al Said, the man who was ultimately responsible for that attack on Tower 22 in Jordan. US officials called the strike a quote unquote dynamic hit, which is military buzzword speak for hitting a fast moving target. That might sound very unimpressive because bombs take out large areas, right? Not exactly this time, good sir, because the attack used a Hellfire 9X missile, which is like yeeting a giant knife at your enemy. It's about five feet long, weighs 100 pounds, and just before impact, it springs out six knife blades or swords, like katanas everywhere. The missile's laser guided, so precise, that you can target the exact seat in a car that you want to hit to minimize collateral damage for sensitive missions. There's no warhead or explosion, so you don't wound nearby people with shrapnel. The missile was said to have been fired from a Predator drone flying overhead. That's like speed running Mario blind. The asset is reserved for some of the highest value targets and often operated by CIA Special Activity Center ground branch operatives. Abu Barik al Saidi was confirmed to have been eliminated. Revenge won't bring back the fallen but it can restore a feeling of justice. Did the second round of strikes have that intended effect? Did they accomplish anything? Well, a month later on February 29th, 2024, military analyst Preston Stewart made an interesting observation on X saying, quote, zero attacks have been claimed by the Islamic resistance in Iraq against US forces since the strike killed Abu Barik al Saidi on February 7th. The wave of US strikes across Iraq and Syria appear to have had a major impact. It appears to be true from my perspective as well as the retaliation had its intended effect, at least for the time being. There were no more constant attacks being launched on US bases. Both sides got to walk away and claim some level of success and victory. Iranian back proxies from their perspective could say that they killed three American soldiers and US military could claim that they got revenge by taking out the leader behind that attack. But the Middle East is still ablaze. Since October, commercial ships in the Red Sea have been under attack from these kind of drone attacks. The US and UK militaries have responded with missiles launched from submarines, warships and airstrikes launched from aircraft carriers. These attacks against the Houthis so far have failed to put a dent in their operations. In fact, it appears to have only made them more bold in the face of them. One of the most recent attacks of which left an 18 mile long oil trail. According to CNN article written by Haley Britsky, Orin Lieberman and Natasha Beratran, the ship called the Ruby Mar is a Belize flagged UK registered Lebanese owned vessel that was hit on Monday, February 19th by one of two ballistic missiles fired by Houthi rebels. The ship allegedly carried somewhere in the ballpark of 41,000 tons of fertilizer, which was released into the ocean is said to be some kind of ecological disaster now at this point. The attack appears to have only be escalating from there because now that ship is said to have fully sunk. And it's the first ship I believe that the Houthis sank with their attacks. And the attacks are getting worse because Houthis have deployed for the first time an underwater unmanned attack vessel. To me, that sounds like a kamikaze drone boat, but worse than that, they've apparently started to cut underwater sea cables that connect Europe to Asia. Four submarine communication cables were damaged in the Red Sea between Saudi Arabia and Djibouti in East Africa. The timing does seem very strange considering foreign policy had just written a piece about how Houthis might start targeting these cables next. If it was just some off course whale's tooth that snagged the cable, that'd be one heck of a cosmic coincidence. These cables are very expensive to repair since it costs about 700 million just to lay them down in the first place. But wait a second, why aren't we seeing this news everywhere? It could be because there are still several working cables so the situation
situation isn't critical yet. Or it could be that these attacks were unconfirmed. CECOM was unable to confirm that the cause behind them was Houthi attacks, so it might have been unrelated. The Houthis themselves officially stated that they weren't involved and didn't claim responsibility, and they usually love to claim responsibility. I didn't hear about this in foreign policy, NBC, Fox, or CNN. This information is coming from the New York Post, who seems to have gotten these details from the Globe, so we have to wait on that still. Since January 12th, this is the fourth round of major strikes carried out by coalition forces. They've hit over 18 Houthi forces locations inside of Yemen. According to Al Jazeera, the US and UK forces struck underground weapons and missile storage facilities. What this means is that we've seen Houthis changing their tactics and adjusting by digging in and spending more of their time underground. So while attacks throughout Iraq and Syria have quieted down, they've sped up in Yemen, and it remains to be seen how this will be resolved. And if you're interested in learning more about US strategic bases in the region, then I wanna direct your attention to this map I have on my wall so that I look more intelligent than I really am. There's very important US strategic bases located in Djibouti. There's also France, they have bases there, and several other countries like China, and all of these bases are starting to compete with each other for space in this crowded area. So if you wanna learn more about that, just click the link in the top, the card for the video, or I'll have a link in the description for the video, or type in Task and Purpose Djibouti into YouTube if you wanna check it out.